Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to the new academic year. Um, Hope everybody transitions well into the new year and had a great summer. Um, and I welcome you all to the first um, of, in a series of Dean's Lectures for this coming year. And I don't, I'm not sure, have we sent out the entire um, list? Um, but the list is being finalized. It's just about finalized and we'll be sending that out so you can mark your calendars for all the great uh, Dean's Lectures that we have uh, coming your way uh, this year. Um, I, I always like to preface the introduction of the Dean's Lecture by conveying the significance of earning uh, the rank of professor uh, at the Bloomberg School. Attaining this achievement represents an incredible achievement by our senior faculty and confirms not only the respect and the high regard of the school, um, but also of colleagues um, around the country and around the world. And the Dean's Lecture um, provides an opportunity to highlight the extraordinary work of our um, uh, newly appointed uh, professors, newly appointed and promoted professors. And today we have the honor to introduce uh, Dr. Gurumethi uh, Ramachandran, or Ram, as he is affectionately known to um, by his colleagues and friends, and I thank you for that. Um, so much easier, <laughs> um, but we're delighted to have uh, Ram with us. But Dr. Ramachandran has actually been a professor for several years, um, uh, but just recently, back in 2016, uh, joined the Bloomberg School uh, in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. Prior to coming to the school, uh, Ram was on the faculty and was a professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. Ram was recruited to the school, as I said, in 19, uh, 2016, <laughs> Uh, to be um, director of our Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health, which has been funded by the National Institute um, for Occupational S uh, Safety and Health, NIOSH, since um, sometime in the 1970s. So we've had a very long and successful uh, program here at the school, and Ram was recruited specifically to uh, direct that program. I'm also happy to announce that as of um, July, um, Ram is serving in the role of deputy chair uh, for the department of uh, EHA. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran has conducted research in various uh, areas related to human exposure assessment in occupational residential and outdoor settings, including the development of occupational exposure assessment strategies for airborne contaminants. He has led or participated in several multidisciplinary teams engaged in numerous community and occupational exposure assessments and epidemiological studies in the US, India, as well as Canada. And since joining the Bloomberg School, he has been working with colleagues in international health on epidemiological studies in Bangladesh uh, related to cook stove admissions and with toxicology colleagues in design exposure chambers for animal studies. He has also been partnering with colleagues over at the School of Medicine on lung uh, dosimetry modeling. And since 2013, Ram has held a visiting uh, professor appointment at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay's Center for Environmental Science and Engineering, and has also served on the Board of Scientific Counselors of NIOSH um, and advisory committees uh, to several organizations, including the National Academy of Sciences and the um, United States um, Environmental Protection Agency. He also serves on the editorial boards of Annals of Work Exposures and Health and on the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene. Ram is an elected fellow of the American Ind Ind uh, Industrial Hygiene Association. Uh, Ram received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology um, in Bombay, and both his master's at, um, degree in environmental engineering and a PhD in environmental science and engineering um, at the university from the University of North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Sh Ramachandran has received numerous awards, including the Top 10 Achievement Award from the American Industrial Hygiene Association and the Kenneth T. Whitby uh, Award of the American Association of Aerosol Research for, quote, significant and outstanding contributions to aerosol science and uh, technology. So it's with great pleasure um, that I introduce you to Professor uh, Ramachandran to present today's lecture. Ram? Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Dean McKenzie, for that uh, kind introduction and also giving me this opportunity to talk to the School of Public Health uh, here about my work. Um, so this is a picture of uh, one of my favorite museums. Uh, it's a small, quirky museum in uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, where I spent, as uh, Dean McKenzie just mentioned, uh, a lot of my academic career. Uh, bits and pieces put together to present a semblance of a whole are the words outside the museum. Um, and I like it, uh, not only for the exhibits inside, but especially for these words because they uh, describe my career uh, quite well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so which bits and pieces should I talk about today? Uh, uh, one of the things, in addition to being the director of this uh, NIOSH-funded center, I'm also, more importantly, a faculty member in, in industrial hygiene. And what I thought I would do is talk about um, what industrial hygienists do um, and how they do it and how good are they at uh, doing it and can we improve how well they do their jobs. Um, so one of the primary goals of industrial hygiene uh, our hygienists is to make sure that everybody, all the workers under their care are uh, safe and uh, they don't face unacceptable exposures to hazards in the workplace. Uh, and they do that by assessing exposures uh, by a variety of means. And uh, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to just talk about how good is this exposure assessment. Um, because this exposure assessment is key to all the other things that the industrial hygienists uh, do, uh, ranging from <clears throat> uh, compliance with uh, regulations, uh, hazard communication, uh, education and training of workers, uh, and uh, what type of controls should we put in place, whether it's engineering or work, pra work practice or administrative or what type of personal protective equipment they need to use and so on. So if we don't get the exposure assessment right, all the other decisions that sort of follow from it are going to be uh, wrong or misguided in some sense. So it's important to get this right. And to set this context, I'm going to give an example of uh, a medium-sized manufacturing facility um, <clears throat> where we have, and this is a real uh, plant, I'm not making up these data, um, so we have these different departments, production, maintenance, engineering, and so on. Um, and in each one of these uh, departments, workers are engaged in different tasks uh, making various products. And, uh, and, and as they go about their tasks, they are handling a variety of chemicals. And this is a modern chemical uh, production facility. So we can assume uh, rather safely that there are about uh, 15 tasks on average per task. And uh, if we then look at these chemical task combinations, um, or what we in industrial hygiene call as exposure groups, uh, these are basically uh, a particular group of workers engaged in a particular task who are exposed to a particular chemical. Um, so for this, we end up with a fairly large number of exposure groups, around 1,400 exposure groups. Uh, throughout the facility, and if we say that, okay, uh, for a sort of a average working year, 250 uh, working days a year, two shifts a day, we end up with a population of around 700,000 exposure opportunities. Um, <clears throat> and here's the rub. Uh, how many times do we actually sample? So what is the most common number of measurements that are obtained by routine industrial hygienists uh, as they go about their job. And uh, some of my students might recognize this slide. The answer is zero. Um, and uh, so most of the times when industrial hygienists uh, make a judgment about exposure, uh, they use their own professional judgment. And I put that in quotes because we need to see whether it's any good or not. Um, so more than 90% of these assessments are based on um, assess or these professional judgments uh, without any data whatsoever. Um, and so uh, that when I started uh, in my academic career, uh, one of the things that intrigued me was that a huge amount of routine day-to-day -day practice was based on uh, 
this very nebulous uh, thing. And I wanted to look at how accurate uh, these judgments about exposure were, uh, whether it's pure professional judgment, it's like a black box in the head of the industrial hygienist, or uh, this black box aided by very, very few uh, data, monitoring data. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about mathematical models and whether they play a role in improving professional judgment. Uh, I also very briefly will touch on uh, the accuracy of exposure judgments in the context of epidemiology, although today I want to focus mainly on the routine practice of industrial hygiene. Um, and uh, industrial hygienists, uh, in their day-to-day sort of -day operations, they follow a fairly uh, straightforward, uh, commonsensical approach to exposure assessment. So for each exposure group, a chemical task combination, uh, the industrial hygienist sort of carries out a basic uh, characterization or understanding of the tasks that are involved, uh, the chemical that is involved, uh, and carries out an exposure assessment, and then makes a decision based on a comparison of that exposure with some kind of exposure limit, and then decides whether the uh, ex uh, exposures are acceptable, in which case everything is good, uh, unacceptable, uh, in which case some control measures need to be implemented, or uncertain, in which case you go out and collect more data. Um, and uh, when we are assessing exposures, we look at a particular uh, statistic of the exposure distribution, and we happen to look at some upper percentile, such as the 95th percentile, and compare a 95th percentile of the exposure and compare it to an exposure limit. So in the uh, bottom uh, part of the slide, uh, if the uh, exposures are less than 10% uh, of the exposure limit, so it's very low exposure, then you might be okay with just providing general hazard communication to the workers and stop there, and that would be your decision. Uh, if it's a little bit higher, so the 95th percentile is between 10 to 50% of the exposure limit, you might want to provide more chemical specific information. Uh, a little bit higher, so now you are uh, getting uncomfortably close to the exposure limit. Uh, that's when you say, okay, I better do uh, detailed exposure monitoring, decide whether people need to be put in medical surveillance, and so on. And then finally, when the exposures are exceeding the exposure limit, so you're out of compliance, uh, you may want to uh, consider more uh, sort of serious measures, such as putting people in respirators and masks and all kinds of personal protective equipment. Um, and as we make these decisions, it's important to also acknowledge that we don't have complete knowledge, especially we are using our professional knowledge, professional judgment, and we have very sparse data. So how, what is the uncertainty and how confident are we in our judgments? And so the chart on the top uh, is, uh, is a decision chart that uh, shows how confident we are in the exposures being in one of these four categories. So in this particular example, uh, it's showing that um, the 95th percentile of the exposure is most likely in category one with a 70% 70 70 uh, probability. Um, and so that, uh, using this sort of framework, we can uh, go ahead and say, okay, uh, let's take a simple example um, and uh, consider one exposure group, and we happen to get three data points. Uh, so for these biostatisticians in the audience, so this is a small data um, uh, scenario, okay? The, the whole field is uh, based on very, very small data, uh, data sets. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the industrial hygienist then, uh, under ideal circumstances, would say, okay, these data are coming from an assumed underlying skewed log normal distribution, and I can then calculate what the 95th percentile is, even though I've got only three data points. Uh, and I compare it against an exposure limit, and uh, the exposure, so here are the three data points, the, the 95th percentile is over there. Uh, well, it's technically uh, less than the uh, exposure limit, but we are probably, uh, uh, there is a wide range of uncertainty around our estimate of the 95th percentile. I can then also, as an industrial hygienist, carry out a very, very simple 
uh, exposure model, where I say that the exposure is, is a ratio of the rate at which contaminant is being generated in the environment uh, and the rate at which contaminant is being moved out by the ventilation system. And if I know these parameters with some degree of uh, uncertainty, I can then estimate what the distribution of exposures will look like in this scenario, and calculate the 95th percentile and so on. And uh, so now I have two different independently arrived at estimates of exposure, and I'm faced with this dilemma of how to pick which solution to go, which, uh, solution to go with, because they might lead to potentially different decisions. Um, and uh, on the one hand, you have this model. You might say, well, this is a very simple or simplistic model, and we're not sure if we actually understand the inputs to be accurate. Uh, on the other hand, the monitoring data are very, uh, it's a very small data set with a huge amount of uncertainty. So what to, which one to pick? And uh, so this is where uh, I started working with uh, Bayesian biostatisticians. And uh, in particular, I see Abhirup here. His advisor was one of my colleagues, uh, still is a collaborator, uh, now at UCLA, but formerly at Minnesota. And uh, so he and I worked together to develop this uh, uh, Bayesian framework in which uh, you can combine this professional judgment uh, along with uh, uh, monitoring data. And uh, it turns out that there is a very strong parallel between what industrial hygienists do and what Bayesian statisticians do. Uh, and industrial hygienists, we didn't know that we were Bayesian statisticians. Um, so uh, in industrial hygiene, we start off with a qualitative assessment. Um, which is the pure professional judgment part, or in this uh, made-up example, I used a model um, where the hygienist can uh, say, okay, I think based on my professional judgment, uh, the exposures are most likely in uh, category two. Um, the 95th percentile is most likely in category two. Uh, then we have our monitoring data, which in this instance also predicts that it's a, most likely a category two. And then um, uh, you can update it using the Bayesian framework and come up with uh, what the Bayesians call a posterior and I call an integrated exposure assessment. Um, and so now we have a much more confident decision that in fact it is a category two exposure uh, and way more confident than either the monitoring data alone or the professional judgment alone. Um, and it's a very transparent way of decision making because once you, you know where the professional judgment is and what role it plays in driving the final decision, you know what role the monitoring data are playing, and then the decision uh, directly leads to an action. And you know where, what the basis for that action is. Um, so the, this all sounds great, uh, and the thing will work only if the priors the professional judgments are accurate. Um, and so on the, um, your left, uh, so this is a situation where things work beautifully, where you have this prior, it's predicting a category two exposure, and you take only two data points, and that also predicts it's a category two exposure, and then you can uh, integrate them in the Bayesian uh, formula and uh, obtain a category two and you can sort of declare victory. Um, but let's say now that in the middle column, uh, the professional judgment doesn't agree with uh, the monitoring data. Uh, so now you have this dilemma. You don't know if you are wrong as an industrial hygienist, or if just two data points, you cannot arrive at any conclusion. So, and the final decision is uh, more driven in this instance by the professional judgment. So what do we do then? Um, and uh, so you clearly uh, don't want to rely on your professional judgment, uh, but at the same time, you don't know if two data points are enough. So the most common sense thing to do is collect more data. And in this case, you go out and collect more data, and then you say, okay, it in fact turns out to be uh, a category two exposure. And what this illustrates is two things. One is either uh, if your professional judgment is wrong, either your final decision is going to be wrong or you're going to spend a lot more resources uh, sampling and so on 
uh, collecting enough data before you arrive at a right decision. And so we want to study how good this professional judgment really is. And I'm gonna present a couple of studies um, looking at this professional judgment with and without uh, using data. And uh, so these were uh, done with uh, rooms full of industrial hygienists that we would gather and we would show them videos of real tasks. Uh, and, uh, and then we also provided them all the information they needed to evaluate the task, you know, the process and the chemicals and what the workers were doing and the safety data sheets and whatnot. Uh, so that was one type of study. And the other one, uh, so actually let me just describe this one first. So what we would do is uh, we'll uh, collect a whole bunch of monitoring data for each task, so five to 24 data points for each task that we would deliberately not share with the industrial hygienists. And, uh, and then we would ask them to make the first judgment just by reviewing all the information except the monitoring data. And so that would be called a qualitative judgment uh, without any monitoring data. And then we would sort of slowly dole out, uh, we'd sort of like, here's the first monitoring data point. Do you want to change your judgments? Here's the second one. Now you have two data points. Do you want to change your judgment? And so we'd go through the whole uh, sequence of data points. And uh, so we would get a whole lot of what are called qualitative judgments and quantitative meaning when they are actually able to observe the data points, the monitoring data points. So that was one type of study. And the other type was uh, rather than this artificial uh, setting of having people collect in a room and watching a video, we uh, recruited industrial hygienists who are working in their companies, and we basically said, why don't you go and evaluate the tasks in your own company? This is your day-to-day -day job. And, uh, but we are, and even they might have seen monitoring data for these jobs. But we uh, sort of told them not to look at any data for at least a month while we are doing these studies. And uh, so these are judgments, again, the same sort of flow uh, but rather than watch a video, they are just observing the tasks in their own workplace. Um, and the study design was uh, sort of an intervention study. So we made them provide judgments before an intervention and after an intervention and compared them. And so the intervention was uh, basically we said uh, that these pi my sort of suspicion ahead of time was they're probably not going to be good. Um, and so we wanted to, uh, our intervention was basically to refresh their memory about how to handle and analyze log normal statistics, uh, how to estimate uh, an upper percentile of a skewed distribution. And so we gave them some uh, rules of thumb, but we also told them, you know, if you want, you can, you know, actually calculate it with an Excel spreadsheet and, you know, they're sort of, they have graduate degrees in industrial hygiene, they should be able to do that. Um, oops. So here are the results from it. Um, so the way to read this chart is, so if, if the industrial hygiene is predicted a certain category um, and the monitoring data that we have, uh, we can run our analysis and find out where uh, the 95th percentile lies. If those categories agree, then they are in the middle column in the correct category. Uh, if the industrial hygiene is pre uh, uh, predicts a category below the true category, then they are counted in the below one category, and so on. Um, and uh, so what we can see are two in interesting things. Uh, one is so before uh, the intervention, the gray bars. Uh, so industrial hygienists are right on average about 40% of the time, um, which is kind of shocking when you think about it. Uh, that only 40% of the, I mean, you would not go to a doctor with 40% accuracy. Um, and uh, the other thing is that um, when we started this study, both the companies and the industrial hygienists who we uh, recruited uh, to be in our studies, they told us, uh, well, you know, we might be wrong occasionally, but we are probably going to be overestimating exposures. We are going to be conservative. Uh, it turns out that is actually also not true. Um, and uh, you can see this uh, underestimation bias here. And they are predicting you know, below one category. Um, so those are two things. So they're underestimating exposures and underestimating workers' risk uh, 
uh, which means they are uh, not protecting them to the extent that they should. And certainly, they're not overprotecting them. And uh, the second thing is, of course, we are, they are wrong most of the time. I shouldn't say they, we are wrong most of the time. <laughs> um, and uh, the, I guess the silver lining in all of this is post-intervention, uh, that bias somewhat goes away, and the percent accuracy increases quite a bit to 60%. Um, so you might wonder, well, why would they not use uh, an Excel spreadsheet every time, calculate the 95th percentile, and just nail it every time? Well, somehow they don't, and they are rather, uh, they would rather eyeball the data and uh, guess where the 95th percentile was, even post-intervention. Um, so my message to them uh, is, uh, whenever I give, present these data, uh, that you should use, even if you have three data points, it's probably better to calculate the 95th percentile than try to estimate it on your own. And uh, lest we think that this is just sort of one academic study, uh, and is it repeatable? Indeed, it is repeatable. Uh, so we've been doing these studies uh, in you know, these annual industrial hygiene conferences. Uh, and uh, these are just sort of four years for which uh, we, well, I'm showing you the data. And uh, it doesn't matter which country or which state we are in. Um, and the other thing I should point out is this is not just that they are company industrial hygienists who are underestimating exposures for evil reasons. Um, our uh, population includes, you know, uh, of course, the company uh, hire, you know, employees, but also people who are working at uh, various federal agencies, work for state departments of health, and uh, other types of agencies, and cons independent consultants. So. So it's a sort of profession-wide phenomenon rather than uh, any kind of bias. Um, so what, are, what happens when we are in an epidemiological context? Uh, so uh, this was, uh, now we are trying to, uh, this was part of one epi study that I was part of uh, where we had to reconstruct uh, historical exposures. Uh, there were 77 exposure groups. And what we did was so gather all these uh, industrial hygienists that were uh, the company employees and asked them to go back in time and assess historical exposures. And uh, so on, for the occasions where we had uh, both the judgments of the industrial hygienists as well as historical data, we could do a comparison of how they uh, sort of fared. Um, and again, we see the same thing. So here we are actually not looking at the 95th percentile, but in fact the arithmetic mean uh, of exposures for different exposure groups. And we see that uh, what I'm showing on the horizontal axis is the arith arithmetic mean uh, in comparison to some reference concentration, RC, and usually it's an exposure limit. And uh, so these are for uh, uh, acrylates, uh, or one type of acrylate. And uh, so you can see that the measurements are here, the professional judgment is off by at least two orders of magnitude. So uh, enormous uh, underestimation of uh, uh, exposures. What happens now when we look at judgment accuracy when there are no monitoring data, which is, like I said, 90% of the scenarios? And uh, so the, these were the results. So um, when we don't have any monitoring data, the percent accuracy uh, is around 30%, okay? And it says, so there, to put that in context, we have four categories, right? If I got somebody from Wolf Street off the street and asked them to predict exposures, they would be right 25% of the time. Um, so we are sort of barely above that. Um, and uh, so uh, we are sort of barely above random chance in our accuracy uh, in pre uh, assessing exposures. So how do we uh, fix this problem? Because this is not only a sort of a issue of professional uh, competence, but also an ethical issue because we are in fact putting people at risk, additional risk, uh, because we are not doing our job well. And uh, so one uh, approach, uh, there are a couple of approaches. One of them I'm going to talk about today uh, is the use of mathematical models. People have typically not been using it because uh, we, uh, it's hard to 
uh, obtain input parameter values for these models. They've not been evaluated systematically in industrial uh, settings, and there is no guidance in terms of what model to use and uh, how, to, uh, how to select a model. Um, <clears throat> So I and my students, we've been looking at a variety of very simple models. Uh, so the first model is uh, what is called a well-mixed room, uh, where you have uh, of this uh, scenario where the worker is doing something, and here's the environment in which uh, the worker is doing his job. There is a rate of contaminant generation. There is a rate of ventilation through this room. And it will be similar to this picture shown here, where uh, this worker happens to be uh, drywall sanding uh, uh, walls that are being put up in a construction setting. And so wherever the workers are, they are exposed to roughly the same levels of uh, drywall dust. Um, there is a second model, which is a little bit more complex, uh, where instead of one uniform well-mixed box, you have two boxes. Uh, one very close to the worker, and then the, so the bigger box. And so you can imagine that that model might work in a case, this is a phar pharmaceutical industry setting where this uh, worker happens to be mixing two chemicals, and her exposure at this workstation might be different from exposure in a, uh, the next uh, workstation over. And then finally we have uh, a third category of models, uh, eddy diffusion models that can work both outdoors and indoors. Um, and this is uh, an application that we are considering. Uh, so these are, in, uh, there's a picture from South Baltimore. These are these coal piles near the industrial area. And as wind blows, some of this coal dust gets uh, transported. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not an occupational setting, but uh, coal dust gets transported into the neighborhoods and um, I'm, uh, along with some of my uh, colleagues, we're trying to look at a uh, measure of exposure uh, from uh, road signs that are coated with this coal dust. And can we um, measure the exposures in these uh, neighborhoods as well as can we model the exposures in these neighborhoods? Um, so how well do these models work in real work environments? And so we looked at uh, 10 different scenarios, uh, and we uh, tried to, since it was a research project, we tried to measure these model inputs as uh, carefully as we could, accounting for uh, the uncertainty and variability in model inputs. And uh, so this is a very busy slide. I don't want you to get uh, too much uh, taken. But we basically measured each of these parameters that are in the model, the generation rate, ventilation rate, and so on. And you can see on the uh, left-hand side the variety of scenarios that we were able to use. Everything from very sort of dirty type uh, environments like an iron foundry or a construction setting, drywall finishing, to pharmaceuticals uh, and to salon manicure and uh, uh, degreasing operations and uh, using acetone and other degreasers. Um, and so these are some pictures. So that's uh, um, an iron foundry uh, where uh, Iron objects are being made. Um, that's a degreasing operation. Uh, there's a mold making facility. There's, there's nail salons. And then there's a pharmaceutical uh, setting. And uh, one of the things, and that, that's the drywall again. Uh, so one of the things that becomes very critical is how uh, can we know how much uh, be, is being emitted by, uh, by uh, of a contaminant is being emitted by your task. And so how much drywall sand is being, drywall dust is being generated by the sanding process. And so um, if you want to know that, I mean, there are no sort of databases available. And uh, so what we ended up doing is uh, we can simulate that task in uh, custom built exposure chambers. And uh, so we can actually, we got a, a drywall sander uh, and come into our chamber. Um, sounds like a nursery rhyme, and come into my chamber. <laughs> um, and uh, we made him drywall sand, and we measured um, the exposures, and we could back calculate what the generation, the emission rate was. And 
And so this is our chamber upstairs on the seventh floor. Um, the previous one was in Minnesota. Uh, it looks a little dark and dingy. This is uh, much nicer and better. <laughs> um, and uh, so I and my students, we are continuing to do this kind of work, trying to find out uh, for standard industrial operations, what is the rate at which um, uh, contaminant is being generated, among other things that we are using this chamber for. So how do these work? Uh, so when we use models, uh, again, the, you have the random chance in the, uh, in the absence of models. And when we use models, uh, our percent accuracy increases uh, dramatically all the way up to 80 to 90 percent. So where are we? we? I talked about the fact that industrial hygiene is significantly underestimate exposures, and, but there are tools to improve their accuracy and you, know, uh, you can do statistical analysis of very small data sets, you can use mathematical models, and one thing I didn't talk about was use heuristics and checklists. But can we rethink this whole thing? Um, the whole reason for getting down this rabbit hole of whether industrial hygienists have good professional judgment was because measurements are kind of expensive. Um, and uh, you know, not only have to pay for analytical costs, but also the costs of the industrial hygienists. Uh, they're not like grad students we can send to make lots and lots of measurements. You have to actually pay these professionals now. Um, but <laughs> um, we uh, are now in an era of low-cost monitoring. And uh, uh, we can, uh, and the costs are reduced by two to three orders of magnitude. And so this is a slide actually from one of my colleagues, Kristen Kohler, uh, who did this uh, study in a real workplace where she could create uh, spatial maps of pollutants uh, in this instance for per PM, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and noise. And these traces you see are the paths of workers who are wearing a GPS monitor. And uh, we can therefore estimate from the sensor network what the exposure is. And the, per the worker is also carrying on uh, his or her body a personal monitor. So we can actually compare does the personal monitor read the sensor uh, network inferred data uh, exposures. And it turns out that in the bottom you can see that uh, for all three uh, workplace hazards, there is a pretty good correlation between what the uh, distributed network predicts and what the personal monitor predicts. Um, there are other ways of creating these spatial networks as well. And so one thing that uh, I and my postdoc are exploring is the use of reconstructive tomography or CAT scans. Um, and uh, so this is sort of a medical CAT scan where you obtain, uh, uh, you sort of have these x-rays passing through uh, the body or the torso uh, of a person. And uh, you can, from these intersecting beams of x-rays, you can recreate the tissue density of, uh, in, in that cross section of the body. So we can do the same thing in an environmental setting where here's a hypothetical room and here these circles are these light beams and detectors, and we have these intersecting light beams, and we can recreate what the uh, spatial distribution of pollutants is. Um, and, the, and we've done some preliminary uh, numerical simulations, uh, and so with various, I'm not gonna to go too much into detail, but uh, here is a room with uh, three different sources, uh, and so as illustrated by the three peaks. And uh, when you have no noise in the data and you have perfect uh, scenarios, when you have about 10% noise in the measurements, and when you have some of the rays that are being blocked by machinery or human beings, uh, so only 25% of the rays actually get from the source to the detector. Uh, so in all these cases, actually, the reconstruction quality is pretty good. And so this is another way of uh, getting a fairly low cost uh, technique for assessing spatial uh, distributions of uh, 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 contaminant concentrations. And we're starting to do these benchtop experiments again in the chamber that uh, I talked about. So where is this all leading? 
uh, is that if we can recreate these kinds of spatial maps and assess each individual worker's exposure, then we can get away from looking at exposures at the exposure group level um, and now get on to personalized exposure monitoring. And so we can then say, uh, I'm going to not look at this entire group of welders. I'm going to look at each welder and look at his or her personal uh, risk profile. And so this is the decision chart now, not for that exposure group, but for an individual worker. And uh, so that would completely change the way industrial hygiene or industrial hygienists operate. Um, and we are, in, in some sense, taking away professional judgment completely from what an industrial hygienist does. So now it's sort of more automated. Uh, and the industrial hygienists can do other things that they are better at. Um, so uh, to conclude, uh, I want to just say these two things I've talked about. So industrial hygienists significantly underestimate exposures. And this is a professional and ethical issue, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, uh, but there are some tools to improve their accuracy. Uh, but uh, if we use these new technologies that are coming in, we can actually change the paradigm in, under which uh, industrial hygiene operates. And, uh, but it, of course, raises other different ethical issues that I'll be happy to talk about later. Um, so finally, I want to thank uh, the various federal agencies that have supported me, uh, my doctoral students over the years, and uh, also these companies that were gracious enough to let me in, and, and their industrial hygienists who let, them, let me in, and uh, were not too mad when I told them they were doing their jobs all wrong. <laughs> So with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Let me um, Very bottom. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Let me begin with the first question. You ended on, on the note that I was going to pick up on, and that is, how do your colleagues, the industrial hygienists, react to all this information? First, you're, you're telling them that they really mm -hmm. are not very good um, yeah. uh, at predicting. And then um, do they accept this new way of looking at things? Yeah, so it's uh, a good question. So. Um, I would say at least the companies that are over there, and certainly some of many of the bigger companies, they are completely on board with the message, and they want to improve. And uh, uh, and uh, I've been sort of along with some of my colleagues doing these professional development courses, and people are very receptive to it. Um, and uh, you know our courses are sold out and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, however. Uh, at the in, uh, institutional level, there is a certification body for industrial hygiene. It's called the American Board of Industrial Hygiene, and it grants certi you know you become certified as a. And so their uh, training and the uh, exams that they carry out, they are not on board with any of these things. Uh, so, uh, but that's a longer initiative, and it'll, hopefully they'll be won over at some point. And, and why are they not on board? Why are these? It's just institutional inertia. There's no sort of yeah. specific intent for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Marsha. So yeah. What is it about the training that these industrial hygienists had that they systematically underestimate? Yeah. You would expect some variation, but it seemed right. like they consistently underestimated the exposure. Right. So we thought a lot about this. Um, and, the, um, and it's not just uh, that industrial hygienists are typically uh, underestimating. In the field of risk assessment also, that's a fairly common phenomenon. Human beings underestimate risk uh, for all kinds of things. Uh, but in this thing, the other uh, thing I, we suspect, I and my colleagues suspect, is we uh, are making a few measurements, two or three at best, 
Um, and these measurements come from a skewed uh, distribution. And so most of the measurements are, or most of the exposures are at the low end of the exposure distribution. And we take a few snapshots at the low end, and we are now asking them to predict something at the very high end, the 95th percentile. And uh, if it had been a normal, uh, sort of a symmetric distribution, I think maybe we would, we would have been better, uh, or human beings would have been better. But I think human beings are not particularly good uh, at estimating um, upper percentiles of skewed distribution if they don't use a statistical tool. Uh, we are not good at eyeballing data. So that's, that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Kellogg. Um, very interesting talk. Um, on the last part there, the personalized exposure measurements as we go forward in your descriptions there, um, would you say, what is the perfect world? That every worker has a monitor on them that's, that's given this and that you then are able to interpret these data? Or is there going to be this push where a, a subset of individuals are being monitored and that's going to give you more data points that are able to infer yeah. what's going on and where's that sweet spot because it does cost more money perhaps and then big data becomes a problem where yeah. do you see this fitting in to you're on the other yeah. end where you have too much information coming in or is that a, a dream that's a good thing right. to have? so um i mean that's an excellent question so we uh, at this point we are thinking that uh we would be monitoring uh, all the workers in a facility, because uh, if we use that distributed network, uh, we would in fact not need personal monitors on each worker. That was just for the sake of this research project. But if we know that the distributed uh, low-cost sensor network works, then all we need to hand each worker is a GPS monitor, and we can track their location, uh, and then infer. So that's where uh, we can infer their, or estimate their exposure it raises a whole host of other ethical questions, right? Um, where are we going to track these workers throughout their um, you know, work day? Um, so that I'll, uh, I don't want to punt and say that's for the ethicists. Um, I don't, that's a, it's a hard question to answer. Um, I guess one easy answer is that there is no uh, guarantee or no, um, I don't know, no expectation of privacy in a work setting. Uh, I know that's not a great answer, but. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was a great talk. And my question directly follows up on Kellogg's, and you sort of just got at it. I was interested about the human drivers to implementing personal monitoring. So I actually didn't have ethics on my mind until you brought up that ingenious second idea. I more had politics and, um, you know, resistance to regulation and all of that sort of thing. And so could you speak to the feasibility of moving forward to implement personal monitoring in this sort of an environment? The distributed network yeah. this, uh, setting. Um, so there is, um, you can look at it purely as an economic uh, case. So we can just say, well, this is way, way cheaper and you will get way more data. So suddenly we are moving from three data points to sort of like big data, like uh, Kella was saying. Um, and our entire field will be changed and you know, hopefully for better, we can better assess workers' exposures. Uh, there is that um, concern about privacy. Um, and where we draw the line between, okay, on the one hand, we are going to be um, not underestimating workers' exposures, not putting them at re real risk um, from you know, various uh, chemical hazards and uh, physical hazards versus um, you know, uh, are we going to track them when they go out uh, and smoke a cigarette and would we know would the employer or their boss know? Um, that is the uh, dilemma or that is sort of the um, trade-off that needs to be, and I don't know the answer to that, but that is the that is really the question. Um. Okay, we have a question in the back, and then we'll take one up here. Yep, go ahead. Oh, I'm the back. Okay, great. 
So I'm glad to uh, hear that everybody else pretty much has a lot of the same questions that I have. But um, considering, one, the amount of cost for personal monitors uh, and even the fact that a lot of people don't wear PII because it's uncomfortable, which means that they probably wouldn't wear the personal monitors because those are also uncomfortable and also noisy. Assuming we get a little bit of information from a few people and also some of the, uh, the monitoring information that you described earlier, could we eventually maybe develop um, a model where we could calculate some kind of uncertainty that we could apply to the industrial hygienist calculations? Because right now, based on all of the wonderful new technology that you presented, yeah. it's expensive. And somebody like me um, probably couldn't write a grant big enough to afford that. Yeah. So what do you think we could probably do something? So you lines? are saying that, yeah, the personal monitoring, the status quo is very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side is, you know, uh, maybe a pipe dream at this point. Can we adopt a gradualist approach? And I think that is probably the most likely scenario in which we'll move, uh, that we start um, these uh, distributed networks and we don't monitor all the workers all the time. Uh, we do some sampling of those workers um, and see if everybody is okay with it. And, and once we are all sort of acclimated to this idea of a slow erosion in our privacy, <laughs> uh, we can move on. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is the most likely scenario. I think you know, we are going to slowly get there uh, because low cost uh, sensors, they are getting uh, cheaper and cheaper by the day. And uh, if uh, Kirsten and I don't say it, somebody else is going to say it. I think that sort of train is, is sort of running already. It's, so. so my question is similar to the other questions, but it's more of what advice do you have for the younger generation of industrial hygienists like our cohort? Um, as we go into the working environment, a lot of them have been doing what they're doing for 50 years. And so how do we implement this new integrated idea or convince them that this is a better and more accurate method? Um, <clears throat> so I would say, you know, for first of all, you are getting a great education here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, also, I think uh, the things that, uh, that are not in your curriculum today, but maybe it should be a few years from now, are in fact sort of these advanced statistical tools and maybe you know, how to deal with big data, how to extract uh, useful information from big data. So we are not there yet, but I can see that in a, I don't know, five, 10 years, that that would be part of sort of the basic skill set that industrial hygienists would need to possess. Ram, yeah. thank you very much. I really enjoy learning about what the faculty and our department do, so I appreciate this. The question I have is you focused on the time of when something starts on the exposure to the worker. What's going on on the, on the earlier side? In other words, the engineering built into these processes to completely eliminate exposure and the effect that robotics is taking a very large role in manufacturing. Yeah, so that, um, that's, so the, um, so the industrial hygiene mantra is that as you, uh, it's best to engineer things out first. And we anticipate hazards and recognize them and, and then we can hopefully sort of design them out as a first step. And uh, the uh, elimination of exposure uh, by substitution or in this case engineering out those are sort of the first steps in any kind of engineering, uh, industrial hygiene engineering design. Uh, so that's already there, uh, but these kinds of situations are going to arise when uh, you know, people are going to be, uh, not everything can be uh, mechanized or uh, done using robots and people are still going to have, workers are still going to be uh, exposed to a variety of chemicals. So I think that part is not going to go away, even if we mechanize large portions of industry. 
Hi, thanks very much for a great talk. Um, I don't know if you read the article in the New York Times in the last few days about the lead and the other contaminants that were released into uh, Paris Notre Dame, yeah. when uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame burned. And the workers were sent in for weeks without any thought that they might be exposed to anything, and certainly not the levels of lead right. that seem to be there. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? Um, I mean, these things always happen, right? So they, in the midst of an emergency, um, workers' exposures are probably the last thing people think about. The same thing happened during the 9-11 first, first responders uh, and the immediate surrounding neighborhoods around uh, the, you know, the uh, ground zero. Uh, workers and the general population, so in the Paris case, uh, there are like, you know, all these schools that were not cleaned for many, many months and so on. Um, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's a reflection of the fact that workers' exposures are, uh, they've always taken a back seat in public health. Um, and uh, I had to start my talk saying, what is an industrial, who are, what do industrial hygienists do? Because it's a thing that people are not aware of. Uh, I think typically, uh, for the vast majority of cases, workers are, in fact, sort of the sentinel cases uh, for exposures. And uh, if you want to understand an exposure, understand it in an occupational setting, and then you can sort of go down to lower exposure areas. Um, in the Paris case, I mean, yeah, I'm sure those workers who uh, w uh, went in first, they are going to have enormous blood lead levels. Um, so yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know what else to say except that, yeah, it's, Thank you for that really interesting talk. Uh, I was just wondering, you, you know, this might cause you to speculate. You might not want to speculate, but I'll ask anyways. Um, you mentioned there's resistance from the professional organizations to kind of move forward with this approach. And I was wondering whether that's because as you begin to treat workers individually, uh, there might be claims of discrimination because of that individual treatment. Mm -hmm. Differential exposures result in differential protections. And if that anyone has ever mentioned that to you, or if you, you've thought that through, if you heard it in the field at all, because I, I, it's clearly something where, you know, kind of the, the law, policy, and regulations, mm -hmm. and the science seem to collide. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would not say that we have thought a great deal about it beyond what I've already spoken. Um, I, you know, uh, Kirsten and I submitted a proposal and one of the criticisms was exactly what you said, right? So uh, how are you going to protect uh, privacy, you know, uh, discrimination against workers? Uh, and, uh, you know, there is no easy answer to this. And uh, uh, especially, you know, in writing a response to a proposal uh, criticism, um, you can at best say, you know, I guess we'll think about it more. <laughs> um, the... Yeah, I don't know what to say except that, yeah, this is something uh, that is, um, there is technology that is going to be changing the way professions are going to be uh, developing and operating, and, uh, and we don't yet have an ethical framework to deal with all of these questions, and that's, we need to work on that aspect. Thanks, really appreciated the talk. Now that you've uh, undermined our confidence in the ability to assess uh, <laughs> risks or exposures, uh, how, how would we compare that to linking the, uh, making the connections in the other directions from exposures in the industrial setting to health outcomes? So if we have you know, relatively you know, some concerns yeah. about estimating exposures, uh, what do we know about the link to health outcomes in exposures in the industrial setting? Yeah, so that's interesting, right? So um, <clears throat> if we are uh, a routine, if I'm a routine industrial hygienist and I'm underestimating exposure, I'm putting people at additional risk uh, because I've underestimated their risk. But if I'm uh, estimating exposures for an epidemiological study and I've underestimated the arithmetic mean like I showed you in one slide, um, and if we carry that into an epi study, uh, the epi study is in fact going to overestimate risk, right? Because we are going to show much higher uh, outcomes for very low levels of uh, exposure. Um, and uh, so both ways, I think, uh, I mean, it would be nice if it all sort of balanced out and uh, it all came out 
uh, even. I don't think that's how it's going to work out. <laughs> um, I think we are going to be, um, I think it's much better to be right. I mean, I don't know how to explain it further, but <laughs> it's probably not good to be um, overestimating risks in an epi study either. So. <laughs> Marsha. I'm just curious whether the companies involved with this are benefiting by underestimating, because at some point they may be liable, mm -hmm. right? When these workers become sick and there's a, you know, yeah. a group. So, sure. I know they don't want to spend a whole lot to to measure things, but they need to be somewhere in the middle so that they're, you know, reducing their liability. Yeah, um, and I think that's where the incentive comes, um, that if, um, so especially the large companies, they actually have historical records going back decades. And I work closely with one company, 3M in particular, and they are actually very open about it, and they share their data, at least with me, they have a whole lawyer division, but you know, they are um, very um, sort of on board with this message uh, that our industrial hygienists are underestimating exposure, that is actually not good. It is going to come and bite us at some point. Um, and I would say that that's probably true for most of the large companies. I don't know about for medium or small scale companies that are, uh, they probably are, like you said, going to benefit by underestimating exposures uh, because they're sort of flying under any sort of reg regulatory radar. Great. Well, with that, um, first of all, Ram, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, everybody, join us in the gallery for some refreshments. <laughs>